Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, our panel uh, about arts and humanities uh, for the future of work. Um, arts and humanities and college campuses for the future of work. We have uh, an awesome panel of experts uh, with us that, uh, who I would love to introduce. Don Carter from Intuit, uh, Christian Garcia from University of Miami, um, Alex Hockman from the University of San Francisco, and Susan uh, Brennan from Bentley University. And we're going to have a conversation about um, what's happening today in, uh, as we look at the transformation of the world of work, how uh, uh, colleges are preparing uh, talent and students for the future of work, and how th that is impacting um, the uh, studies and the practice of arts and humanities on college, and campus, uh, college campuses. We're seeing uh, already uh, some challenges in enrollment in arts and humanities. Um, I think in one of the panels earlier, we talked about how computer science and engineering uh, majors are, are stealing students, uh, if you will, from, from those types of majors. And uh, I think there's a really a, a, an, an honest question that, and conversation that we need to have uh, about arts and humanities place um, in higher education today in the world of work. And that's why we have a diverse um, uh, panel today to have a conversation about that. So I'll, I'll start it first with the obvious question, is there a place for arts and humanities in the world of work uh, in, of the future? Uh, Don, you're representing the employer side. So what do employers say about that? Is there, is there, is there a place for that? And I would love to hear after, uh, after you, maybe Susan can comment from the college side and then anyone else can jump in. Thank you. You know, the answer is, oh my God, yes. <laughs> you know, if I think about the hippo and the geek talk this morning, do you really want a whole bunch of hippos and geeks and no arts and humanities? <laughs> um, and I look at the evolution of arts and humanities and what I love that we're seeing in some of our universities, and some of these aren't even our core schools. Um, we hire over 35% um, of our hires don't come from a school we touch base on. Over the last three years, they represent over 115 different universities in the US. Mm. And to us, that's exactly what we want. We want that difference of thought and expertise. And what we're seeing on campus are these programs where you have arts and humanities organizations that decide to walk across the quad or walk across, the, I call it the vortex, and start thinking about design learning or start thinking about computer science courses. Um, I'm gonna use Stanford as an example. Over like 98% of the students take a computer science entry level class. And, and we don't expect everyone to be a computer scientist, but we definitely need that design thinking and that design thought process but we want them to bring their arts and humanities backgrounds to how they're solving problems for our customers. Because not all of our customers are geeks. If you think about it, we have so many different types of customers that we solve problems for globally that we really need that globalized view and lens in our organization. I will just add on, I think I come at it from somewhat of a unique perspective in the sense that I've spent the last 25 years working in business career education, um, but I will, I, and I will add to, to Don's point that yes, it needs to not be this false choice between is it the professions, whether business or engineering, or the humanities and liberal arts, it is and. And so in my role at Bentley University, where I've been for the last 15 years, we have a model that's really about fusion between business and the arts and sciences so that you don't have to make that false choice, that it really is that what if you're studying finance, you can also combine that with sustainability or with healthcare and whatever is your passion, take half of your courses in arts and sciences to have that foundation to be able to then think about ways that you can start to form those connections and bridges. And what employers are telling us is exactly um, to your point that, um, you know, it's really binary is kind of the en enemy of creativity is, is something that I've been thinking a lot about because it's all about that connection and intersection between, between the fields. And that, I think, is what is, um, you know, really what we owe to our students as well is to make sure that they are having this holistic education. I think it goes back to it's more than just STEM, it's STEAM, mm -hmm. right? And we owe it not only to us, our employers, our workforce, we owe it to us as 
as a country mm -hmm. and how we're evolving globally. Like if we cannot figure out how to integrate different minds and modes of thinking, we're never going to change as a society. And so to me, it's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I was really excited when you asked me to be on this panel because you know, it's super important not only to myself, but to our organization. Hmm. I want to add it. So two things. One, um, if, if anyone hasn't checked out LinkedIn's new monthly reports that they're doing by region, mm -hmm. um, they're really worth looking at. Um, and uh, for the April report in San Francisco, the top 10 skills that are in overabundance are all coding. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a surprise to me because I'm always worried that our students aren't learning how to code, especially if they're a liberal arts major. And the top 10 skills that were in most desirable were all your typical kind of humanities skills, i.e. communicating with people by voice mm -hmm. and talking with each other. Um, so it's nice to see data there to back that up. And then in kind of in perfect timing for this panel, Friday morning I took a group of uh, 15 of our top finance students downtown for one of our finance tracks. Um, and these are like all three, seven or above. They've all had three internships. They're your perfect kids. And we waltz into Bloomberg. And who does Bloomberg have presenting to them but two communication majors? Um, from the last three years, basically telling them that their finance degrees are worthless as far as Bloomberg is concerned, <laughs> uh, and they can teach them all the finance stuff on the spot. They need people who can come into Bloomberg and communicate um, and work with teams and don't worry about the stuff you're learning in school because we're going to teach you a whole different way to do that anyway. We go to Silicon Valley Bank next, exact same sentiment coming from liberal arts majors presenting, all who are these kind of higher up, super impressive people in the world of finance in the Bay Area. Um, so I think there's lots of there's lots of room. I mean, I think of two things. I, I think, first of all, um, it's, it's getting the students who are liberal arts majors, the humanities majors, to understand that they have valuable skills. And so we spend a lot of time educating these students. So it's great when they hear it, when they do these treks. I think we're trying to do it even before that, um, yeah. especially not just for the 3.7 and above. Yeah. And it, yeah. A lot of these treks tend to be for the 3.7 and above. And I would argue that those students don't need those treks. Right. Not to put you down. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> you know, I just think that we see this in schools of business and all the other, um, other disciplines as well. So we're, we're doing a lot to educate these liberal arts majors and let them know you can work in all sorts of industries. Um, and also to change the messaging that they're hearing from faculty and from their peers. So there's a lot of norming that we need to do on our college campuses or that we're doing on our college campus for sure. I think the other thing is, you know, we hear from employers a lot um, that, you know, we want, you know, these liberal arts majors. But yeah, when they come to campus, again, what we're trying to educate them on is you're saying this, but you're still recruiting by major and you're still recruiting by GPA. So you're saying you want to change it up, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, that we're here, and again, not all employers. So we're, we're doing a lot of education on the on the student side, but also on the employer side, because we're hearing that a lot. But the message isn't trickling down when they get to campus. So th this all sounds beautiful. Uh, but when I <laughs> when I think of the parents who are doing college tours, yeah. and who, when I think of the parents who are showing up on our in, a, in our uh, office doorsteps on college campuses, not all of them, but but many of them. And who are saying, I don't want my daughter or son to um, major in, a, in an arts and humanities uh, uh, discipline because they're not learning any skills or they're not learning any skills that are applicable in the workforce. That's what they're saying. Um, the question is posed, what are you, liberal arts universities or colleges doing to adequately prepare students for the future of work, for just the workplace in general? Are they doing enough? Are they do, what are they doing to adapt? What are your thoughts about that? Well, I'll jump in because I have two students who are in college. Two, <laughs> two of our kids are both liberal arts majors. And so I think in part as someone who's worked in the world of business education and, and really um, you know, thought a lot about what is the future of work going to look like, I encouraged our, our kids to pursue liberal arts. But I also said I need to know that the institutions are making them relevant. Um, you know, I think Brandon Bustide from Gallup today talked about when they talked to 250,000 um, college students across the country, you know, what was the one thing that made a difference about their education and connecting to work, and it was about relevance. And so, you know, we, I looked for institutions that, w and they certainly looked for institutions that understood the other side of the coin. So whether it was a liberal arts education that would then think about the fusion of whatever would be the digital mindset for the future and understanding sort of how the, the pieces as a philosophy major or a Chinese major or a political science major were going to connect to the world of work, that there would be this intentionality about making those connections and that there would be priority around the 
experience. And you know that from the messaging of, of those conversations that you have on campus. And you also know that you know, it's not only about curriculum, that it is also about all the other experiences that make a difference, including having the access to experiential learning. Are you going to be near a city where that's going to be accessible? Having access to mentors where the institution is buying in. So all of those pieces have to connect to the curriculum as well as to the entire experience. And by the way, we haven't talked at all about AI, but the fact is that more than ever, I think that the liberal arts are going to be what's required and to, for us not to, for those jobs not to be automated. So it's more important than ever. That's true. Because robots can't do arts and humanities. To the best of our knowledge. In the panel before this, was one of the things that um, one of the panelists said was how career centers are really great at collecting data, analyzing data, and really pushing mm -hmm. that out there. And so when I do, when I have parents come to you know the career center and say, well, you know, I don't want Johnny, you know, studying English or humanities. You know, I really use the data to really show mm -hmm. that our, those students are. Mm -hmm. They're just as successful as our business majors and our engineer majors in terms of finding jobs and in terms of salaries. Mm -hmm. And if you look even beyond that first job, second job, five years down the line, mm -hmm. they're doing just as well, sometimes even better than those mm -hmm. students. So I let the data speak for itself, and mm -hmm. I think that that really makes them feel a little bit better. Because there's a lot of, you know, you always heard, you know, English majors, unemployable. You know, psychology <laughs> majors, oh, you need to get a master's degree. And yes, you know, if you want to, it, you have to be a little bit more creative, but I think if you know what your strengths are and you really um, know what companies are looking for and, you've, and we've educated the students, they do really, really well. Hmm. I think of some of the top talent acquisition leaders mm -hmm. or some of the top CHROs, they don't have an HR degree mm -hmm. at all. No. They're a wealth of arts and humanities. They're a wealth of sciences. They're a wealth of taking what they learned in the university ecosystem and utilizing that to the best of their interest of who they're trying to serve. And so I think it's that's how we have to really change the lens is find out what a student loves to learn. I don't care if that's art and humanities. I don't care if that's ag science. I was a hotel restaurant management degree. I ran restaurants and hotels. Like, I don't use my day to day, but I use the overarching of everything I learned in college. And I go back to what you said too, which is I went to a learn by doing school, I went to a teach by doing school, and that fed into me. And so I think it's more than just picking the right major, it's picking the right culture of the school mm -hmm. that your son or daughter or child is going to thrive in. So that's something I always teach my executives when they come to me and be like, my kid wants to go to this small or large school. I'm like, go, it's awesome, they'll have a great time. And they're like, but I want them to go to Wharton or Harvard or blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, they should go here. Well, mm -hmm. Alex, how, how, how do we make that work when college costs so much these mm -hmm. days? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, it comes back to what Christian was saying, and it's all about data and, and, and making, making, making is a harsh word, but, but helping parents understand what, what exactly it is that they're getting for their dollar, or let's be honest, more, more likely than not, for their loan or for their student loan, and what's the payoff going to be in return. You know, Farouk mentioned in the last panel a, a parent who said that none of the schools he went to with his kid talked about career services. That was me, <laughs> right? So we visited 27 universities during the admissions process this year with our daughter. It's really weird being on the other side, being wooed as the customer, when I do 45 presentations for admissions with USF trying to woo the customers. Um, but at the end of the day, it's up to the schools, I think, to make the, and, and, and you know, now, now I'm, I'm really putting my money where my mouth is because our kid's going to like one of the most liberal artsy schools of all time. Um, but it's this idea of getting across to families, what is it that you're getting beyond a beautiful campus and great food and uh, the fantastic faculty member who's gonna be in a classroom of 12? Um, none of that matters to me. I wanna know that my kid's gonna be <laughs> employed. Um, and I think that if you search for the data, and some schools are throwing it at you, which I love, some schools, I think the parents kind of have to dig a little bit. And I, I wish that schools would do a little bit better of a job of making that data available from the get-go and letting parents see, hey, this is reality. When, when you know, last week I had the joy of going to Honolulu to present to 160 families who have three weeks to make up their minds to plunk down their deposits somewhere, and, and I showed them a slide, it was an MPEG of handshake for an environmental studies major. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of was a surprise to some of the parents because they expect to see 
finance or accounting or computer science, but I wanted them to see environmental studies and hear the different options, and some are totally tied into the word environment, and some have nothing to do. They're investment banks who are happy to interview environmental studies majors. So being as transparent as possible and getting it out there before the child is even at the institution. But I want to add that um, we've done some testing, actually, with high school students about different messages and which ones resonate. And what we found, actually, is that when, you know, our, our institution is all about the fusion of business and liberal arts. So we tested that concept because we had really been promoting that and thinking, wow, you get the best of all worlds. It's that perfect intersection. 17-year-olds did not understand it. Mm -hmm. It did not speak to them until you start to actually tell the stories and they can start to imagine it. But they, you know, even the word liberal um, and how that's interpreted mm -hmm. when 17-year-olds when are looking at it or their families. So I think that, you know, the onus is on the institutions to actually start to visualize what those pathways could actually look like, hearing from stories from, from graduates who have gone on and found ways to study environmental science and marketing and go work for Patagonia, you know, doing yeah. sustainability. So those are the kinds of things that I think that you need to hear, but I have the, the message that resonated the most, even more than this idea of seeing the pathways, was actually about the plan. And I think that's the other piece, um, you know, in terms of what onus is on liberal arts institutions and schools overall is just how are you going to be the guide for the student who I call the hero in the story and help them to navigate that plan because we can say it's all there for you and you can explore all these things but you know the fact is that advi academic advising does it doesn't always help with that process career advising need all of the pieces need to be integrated and they need to see how that plan is going to actually work for them to be able to understand all of those connections. And we have to be much more structured and deliberate, I think, about not leaving some of those experiences to mm. chance. My that app you mentioned in the last panel, Farouk, we need it. Well, that sounds great, yeah. <laughs> my biggest concerns, we're talking about people who bring their parents. Yeah. I have a school that's one of my core schools where 50% of those kids, first generational. Mm -hmm. right. They're the 25 year old. They're working full time. So my concern, honestly, is around how do we get access mm -hmm. to the family unit around why arts and humanities is important. Mm -hmm. Because if you're, this Generation Z is choosing university very different, mm -hmm. which is why we just open as wide, we don't care what school you go to, we have no GPA requirement, mm -hmm. we want everyone to apply to the role that makes sense to them. Um, and we're hiring different types of people than we hired two years ago. And so my concern is when we keep talking about this mm. traditional go visit a university, what does that look like mm. to the family that sits in the middle of the San Joaquin Valley in California where high school graduation rate could be less than 50%. Mm. Yeah. And they can't leave their farm mm. or they can't leave their family owned business to go to a school visit. And so I think about that whole, how do we, as you guys talked about earlier and early in the morning, how do we start thinking about how we deliver that experience to different families? So I'm wondering, how, what are some of the things that are happening? What are some of the strategies that are being applied uh, to ensure that liberal arts education is accessible to students from diverse backgrounds, from uh, diverse socioeconomic backgrounds? Um, I think that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Well, what are some of the things that are happening on your college campuses or even that you're seeing done uh, on the campuses that you're visiting uh, or how industry is interacting with that? One, one thing I love, so 40% of the students at USF are first generation and, and when I go to talk with families, it's 40% it's first generation families. So a lot of the families who we're talking to, their parents don't know that such a thing as a career center exists. Mm -hmm. So they're getting excited just that they're hearing about career <laughs> services they, did, they didn't know that that was an add-on, that that was like a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we try to explain it's not an add-on. It's, mm -hmm. it's part of the, whole, of the whole culture of the university. Um, but I think it's really important to, to explain to families that are first-gen parents or families that this is a massive stretch, and, and this is kind of coming back to what I said before, exactly what does this look like on the end? And we do try to have, I think you, you alluded to, mm -hmm. solid examples of students who literally you know, we can do this by, by city, by high school, who came from your high school, who were here five years ago, and here's their path, and then they can turn around and, of course, act as mentors. But we also partner with, um, USF does a lot of programming. There's something called the Muscat Scholars 
um, which is are all first gen students. They come in a week early, but they're out there during the admissions process as well. So when you're a family, um, you or or we do have students who come without any family, but you're seeing someone from my office next to Char Lobo Soriano who runs the Muscat Scholars Program, explaining how Muscat Scholars and Career Services partner together so that throughout your four years as a Muscat Scholar, you're also having built in work with the Career Services Center. I, I wish faculty were as flexible as groups like Muscat Scholars were as far as letting us kind of partner with them and do things. Mm -hmm. you know, we just um, kind of looked into the you know, first generation, and it's, at the University of Miami, you'd be surprised. This is something that we're just scratching the surface on, you know, which is really surprising to me. It's always been surprising to me. I've been there 17 years. I'm first generation. <laughs> and so I've always been like, you know, why is no one talking about this? So I would say in the last couple of years, people are finally talking about it. That being said, some of the, the, the biggest users of our career center are first generation mm -hmm. college students. They're the ones that are using our services. They're the ones that are being proactive. They're the ones that are really taking advantage of almost every single service that we have you know, to offer, which is amazing. And we're seeing them from all kinds of you know, disciplines in terms of you know, we have our business majors, but a lot of them are our psychology majors, our biology majors, our humanities majors. So you know, I, I think that there's this notion that you know sometimes that first generation students are lost and that they need a lot of you know direction. And I think that yeah, that there are certain things that I should, certainly would have appreciated helping when I was an undergraduate. And obviously, that was a long time ago. Um, but I think that these are students who are really resilient. And um, at least from what I've seen at the University of Miami campus, we're not seeing a huge issue with students really struggling with you know, do I want to, should I be a humanities major? My parents want me to be this. You know, we're seeing their parents are very supportive. So that's just something you know at, on our campus, which I'm very you know fortunate, um, or I'm happy to see. I think some of the issues that we see with our first generation students tend to be um, s separate from that. I think, you know, we're dealing with more about, you know, financial kinds of issues. Not all of them, but a lot, you know, a lot of our students are dealing with that. Um, some of them, you know, intertwined with, you know, racial ethnic, you know, issues on campus where they're feeling, you know, isolated. Again, not all of them. Um, but when it comes to the career piece and, and selecting a major, we're not seeing many of those issues, mm -hmm. thankfully. Don, what are you, well, what do you look for in uh, college students, in college talent, and uh, what are the gaps that you're seeing today, especially when you're um, um, uh, re recruiting uh, arts and humanities majors? That's a great question. I think for us, we look at, we try and look at the totality of the student, right? So one of the things that we did this year, uh, we've launched an entire new interview process and um, I sat down with legal and I said, what is it gonna take for us to be able to give students feedback? No one is doing that in my industry. Mm -hmm. And the only way that we're gonna grow and tie our mission, which is about prosperity, mm -hmm. is to actually give someone feedback and mm -hmm. let them grow. And so we actually um, hold a certain amount of spots for freshmen and sophomores. Uh, we're already interviewing for next year's class right now. But half of the class that came in this summer we had interviewed last year gave them feedback and they came back. So we're talking about how do we educate that group of folks. Um, we met some great arts and humanities students at the Grace Hopper Conference. They just weren't quite there on the coding yet, so we gave them boot camps. Uh, we're also partnering with uh, code organizations to actually build our own curriculum with them. Yeah. Um, and we're going back with everyone that actually didn't pass coding or didn't pass some of our interview processes to give them like a boot camp and hopefully bring them back. So we're really trying to target students that have a diverse background, a diverse, somebody who hit the values, because I can't teach somebody values. I really can't. I can teach them how to code, I can teach them how to be a data scientist, I can teach them how to be an HR or talent acquisition, but I can't teach someone values because sometimes values is common sense a little bit. And so sometimes, you know, first generational students, we see uh, them needing a little bit more common sense classes. And so uh, we launched a jump into it for all of our new college grads. We cohort all of our new college grads. So we took lots of learnings from the educational side and infused those learnings into how we're doing. Um, and that really has helped our students prepare and excel. Um, and we're just running data and analytics on all of our hires from two years ago and just starting to see what percentage of those are in our highest echelon of game changers. And it's interesting, the mix and what the data is. But for us, it's not just about the take, it's how we give back, it's how we educate, it's how we find the right schools or find the right students and then have them go back and find more students like them. Mm -hmm. 
It sounds to me like you're running University 2.0. Um, well, I learned how from do the you best. Feel, <laughs> and, and it's great, but shouldn't um, the university be doing more of that so that you don't have to do it? How do you feel about it? And how does, and, and, and perhaps not just you personally, but how does industry uh, feel about that, that? That you're having to really do a lot of additional training and skill development to get these uh, uh, hires ready. Um, I think it's more than just getting them ready in our industry. I think it's around how do we continue to elevate them, give them growth, give them mobility. If we assume they're going to come out of your ecosystem and be 100% there, that, that's just pretty naive of us. And when you guys talked about earlier on the evolution of career centers and career mobility and career learnings, I loved all the new words I was hearing, <laughs> is that we just couldn't accept, we couldn't expect you all to have it. And the reason I say that is, I know you do, I know you do, and I know all you guys do. But there are one person career centers in this country. And some of those career centers don't have Wi-Fi. I cannot expect the same thing from them that I might expect from you. And so we really took a step back and really thought about how do we take the equality out of the career center, not really think about it that way, but really think about the student in that way. So we're still learning, have lots of learnings, um, and some more programs will be launching this next year. Susan, shouldn't we be on the college uh, side uh, more engaged and involved in skill development um, to help make this transition more seamless? You know, we had an, an interesting opportunity to sit down with the CEO of PwC last week who came to our campus, and they're one of our largest employers, and he was talking about their commitment to, I think, $35 million to upskill their employees. Hmm. So, you know, I think that the point is that the diploma is only the beginning at this point, rather than thinking that that's the end of our learning and that it's going to have to be this partnership between higher ed and employers in terms of what, I mean, there's no such thing anymore as last mile skills. It's going to be this ongoing upskilling that we all need to do and own and have the mindset, the growth mindset that we're going to commit to it. So I think that there are, um, I, I think Don's point, it's, it's, it's very refreshing, and I think Christian made the point earlier that, um, you know, we want, that, that we're hearing from CEOs that they want these well-rounded competencies, and then we're hearing from recruiters, you know, who tell us that, well, we aren't going to recruit your corporate finance and accounting, but we'll take your economics finance. I mean, these you know, precise distinctions, and it only can be at this GPA, and it can only be if you had a CIS minor combined. So, you know, I think we still have the struggle of the um, big picture executive who makes talent the top priority, and the recruiters in the trenches who are, are hiring for, for skills that we possess now. So that's a real tension that I don't think we fully address, but right now I would say that, you know, we all own some part of this, and it's not just higher ed and, um, and employers, it's also policymakers. it's also um, accreditation. I mean, there are so many other pieces to this. Mm. So, you know, at the University of Miami, we started a program several years ago called the Professional Development Academy, which is this nine-week intensive, you know, program where we put students through, you know, all these different um, activities and workshops and, you know, programs, and it's all run by employers, by faculty, by staff, just logistically run by the Career Center. Um, and since then, we've kind of broken it into different disciplines. So there's a healthcare one, there's, um, a, there's a, we did one for, oh, it's STEM. But the most popular one and the most successful one, successful one I think, was for liberal arts majors. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, we engaged with the faculty and staff and they were so excited because we didn't know what their reaction was going to be when we approached them about doing this. They were really excited. We got a lot of buy-in. Um, and I would say, at the end, it culminates into kind of a showcase, kind of like a science fair kind of a thing. And there's, you know, employers who judge it and the winners receive, or the winner or winners receive, you know, a scholarship. Um, and the feedback that we heard from the employers who have done it multiple times was that the one for the liberal arts was the most successful. Mm -hmm. That these students were able to articulate themselves mm -hmm. so true. well and so clearly. And when you heard from the students, the confidence boost that that nine weeks pr provided for mm -hmm. them was amazing because they didn't think at the beginning mm -hmm. that they could do this. Now the issue is, as we've been talking about um, for the last day or two, is scale. How mm -hmm. do you scale that? Because you know you have you know 25, 30 students. So now the next you know 2.0 of that is, you know, doing it, offering it online or some kind of blended model. But again, you know, how do you 
do that in a way that you're scaling it, but also not watering it down so much that that impact isn't there because those students were just you know blown away mm -hmm. and just kind of seeing the growth in those nine weeks. But also nine weeks is a long time, mm -hmm. especially when they're not receiving academic credit. They're getting a transcript notation, and yeah, they may win two thousand dollars at the end, but it is a, a significant chunk of time when they're also studying full time. Many of them are working part time, mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at different ways of doing it. But um, you know, it goes to show that you know, and we talked about this mm -hmm. on the phone recently that this notion of soft skills. How we hate that mm -hmm. word because really the soft skills are the hard skills. Mm -hmm. right? um, we could teach you. I can't teach you not to be a jerk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I've tried. I can't. <laughs> Sometimes I shake them, <laughs> but I can't teach you all the other stuff. So um, yeah. that's good, uh, Alex. Anything that's happening at USF? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I wish we had something as as formal um, as what's going on at University of Miami. One one area where our office has taken advantage, um, but USF faculty are um, unionized, um, so they have very formal rules, um, including they are allowed to miss X amount of classes, just not show up each semester with no penalty. Um, what's at all, but we reach out at the beginning of every semester to our faculty and we have something called DCC, don't cancel class. We'll mm -hmm. say if you know that you're going to be out, rather than having the students show up and you're just not there, um, which is totally acceptable at USF, um, why don't have one of our counselors come in, take the class for you, and that way we have the luxury That's of really 19 true. sociology majors on a Tuesday morning who are there for class. A lot of times the faculty won't even tell them that they're not going to be there, um, so we walk in and they're sometimes surprised, sometimes uh, angry, sometimes happy. Um, but, but we can then really target that career presentation to a social junior about what, what you might be taking advantage of and get a better sense, rather than, sure, just like everyone, we do a Wednesday night LinkedIn workshop for, for all, but those are right. It's coming back to the students who go to that are usually the students who need it the least. Right. Two thirds of our don't cancel class requests come from, uh, from arts and sciences. Um, and we did 100, and we're gonna do 157-ish, uh, 30 days to go uh, this year. So that's a lot of access to students, and you get the buy-in on the faculty side that you're doing them a huge favor, uh, so that, which is nice as well. What's come out of that is the feedback from students has been so positive that now a lot of those faculty just build us into the curriculum, and, and often they don't even take the day off. They show up and just stand next to us mm -hmm. while we're talking. So uh, coming back to environmental studies, a few weeks ago, I was in uh, an environmental studies practicum, and it was me, and this is pretty much my standard routine outfit, next to the most stereotypical environmental studies USF faculty, long beard, Birkenstocks, I don't think he'd showered in a while, and it was like, he looked like he'd come right up I from Hate from, yeah, yeah, He looked like he'd come right up from Hate Street a few blocks away. But the fact that they're getting them, the students in environmental studies are getting the message from someone from our office, in this case it happened to be me, with their faculty member who they adore, standing there who looks and acts 100% different than anyone in career services, nodding and smiling, makes all the difference in the world. It, it's faculty buy-in wherever you can get it, whether it's, it's formal or informal in our case. But I, if we're gonna talk about faculty, which we just <laughs> have to go there, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I think makes this whole model that I am advocating for, which is this idea of fusion, and that you know we want our students. I, I, if if my son chooses, for example, to be a philosophy major at a liberal arts college, I'd love it if he also could take some technology, you know, digital um, courses, and be able to have those combinations. I don't think that the academy has figured out how to make that possible, either in a large university where you're an arts and sciences major, and so never the two shall meet where you could take courses in business or engineering, and, and vice versa. And so, you know, we have one faculty, and so the whole idea is about making all of the curriculum complementary and contextual, and from what I understand, that that is really pretty unusual in the academy. And so the question is, you know, for liberal arts to stay relevant, how is the academy going to find solutions where we can get outside of our own sort of bureaucracy and find ways for to allow students to be making those connections? And not, by the way, my pet peeve, which is that, um, you know, I feel like I'm being upsold by institutions who say, oh, your child's a liberal arts major, but they might need some business skills. Would you like to pay for the summer $20,000 to do a boot camp? Yeah. And the answer is absolutely not. Right. That should be part of the experience. Right. So how do we want to support the entrepreneurship and business ideas that could come from making liberal arts students well-rounded, but 
my belief is it should be part of the experience, and I don't think we're set up to make that happen. I go back to what if we everyone did two years of arts and humanities, like just two years of it, mm -hmm. and then you add on your certificates mm -hmm. and your other stuff. I jokingly think computer science is going to be the IT degree in seven or eight years, maybe not even that. Don't mm -hmm. quote me on it. And that becomes a data science, machine learning, whatever those degrees are. But I mean, like, could you imagine the different ways that scientist or computer scientist or even data scientist would solve problems? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, we need to rethink education and you know, maybe with the decline of education, maybe that will force it to be rethunk mm -hmm. or rethinking. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I just feel like we have such major opportunity in this country and we're so far from it. And I think part of that is old school faculty a little bit. Mm -hmm. would, I said it out loud. I'm sorry, yeah, folks, if any okay. of you in the room. No, it's okay. <laughs> and it's okay. And George Bush joked about strategic race. Okay, good. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. He did. That's true. What, what I'd that's like, like to see, Farouk, one, one of the things that I thought was, was um, interesting, um, coming back to our trip to Bloomberg and Silicon Valley Bank, both places, even though they said they, they love liberal arts majors, they said in a perfect world they would get a liberal arts major who didn't know anything about finance, even though that's what they're going to be doing. Yeah. But who could at least know basic Python, C++, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some type of a coding language, not because they're ever going to have to code in their jobs, but because their clients and everybody around them can, and it would just help them in the Bay Area to be able to speak, unlike me, who can spit out the words Python and C++, but I have no idea what that means, <laughs> right? Um, sounded like you did. Right, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, 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 yeah, right. For, for, for the Miami folk, I'm high tech. Yeah. But, but it's just that concept of most of our students, look, I, most people come to the Bay Area and they want to stay, and a lot of people come to USF because they want to work at Facebook, Tesla, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but that I get. It's that idea of, you know, you don't have to know it at an expert level. You might not even right. have to minor in it, but just enough so that you're able to talk about it in a, in a regular setting in, in kind of everyday life in the Bay Area. Mm. So, so, uh, so uh, some of the, the students, in the absence of these very structured ways mm -hmm. to, to integrate skills with arts and humanities, uh, some of the students are taking the approach of a gap year. A mm -hmm. uh, gap year during their four years in college, so some even after, you know, like, like I'm not gonna go work, but I'm gonna do a gap year and I'm gonna go and develop my, my skills, some even before they get to college. What are you seeing there, the, 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 the Don? And uh, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that trend and where it might be going. God, I wish this trend was around when I was in school because <laughs> I probably wouldn't have spent four years in the hotel and restaurant industry and would have probably done something different. But where we're seeing it um, are students that want to take it after. So they may have been an intern with us. They'll come to us and say, hey, I want to take a gap here. We're like, great, here's your offer for a year from now. Mm -hmm. Talent is too hard to find. Mm -hmm. And what they're going to go learn is life experiences. And that's what we think about when you bring your whole self to work, is those life experiences. So I think in this world of gap year, I love it. I mean, I think it's a great opportunity for students. Um, I wish I would have done it. I think my father would have killed me because it took me like five and a half years to get out of school because I changed my major four times. But I, I do think that for folks who, who just want to have experiences and put those on top of what they've already learned in school, I think it's great. And we would hire them a year later. I'm trying to figure out is do we even have an intern program around it? Mm -hmm. So is there an apprenticeship gap year program? Mm -hmm, right. I'm arts and humanities. I want to become a data scientist. So we're we're mm. we're looking at some different ways to think about gap year. Yeah, I'm gonna have a violent reaction against gap year. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm, 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 with I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> but that's because I'm helping to pay the tuition. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you know, my feeling is just that um, that the. You look at the Gallup research, which talks about you know, having experiences that would be a semester or more that would be taking classroom learning and applying it to the real world. But then the big piece, and that does make a difference in our overall engagement in, in, um, in work and life after graduation. We, so we know that's meaningful. I think that this piece that we, the role that we play is the sense making. You know, that we, that students can take some, so I guess I, I am all for some kind of a 
you know, micro internship, internship experience out in the world, testing things out. And then we as educators help our students to make sense of those experiences. And what I've recently heard from faculty, because we're going through a curriculum review, is they said, things are happening so fast, there is no way that we can keep up. But if our students are going out and doing credit internships and coming back and we're helping them make sense, then we actually are taking that learning and applying that into our classroom. So that's the cycle that I think that we need to be learning from. So I'd like to just see more immediate, you know, students take, feel the heat, experience those um, ways of the extended classroom, and then come back and we help them make sense, understand their talents, and go back out and do it again. And in the process, we're updating curriculum and partnering with those employers to figure out where the world of work is going mm -hmm. more quickly because um, you know, we are just way too slow for them. I don't know, maybe, um, bless you. Um, maybe, <laughs> do we feed into this whole notion of, okay, so art, you know, humanities majors, liberal arts majors, you know, they get a bad rap of not knowing what they want to do or they're unemployable, whatever it is you want to call them. And then to tell them, oh, take a gap year, are we feeding into this whole notion of like, let's just keep delaying it? Let's, you know, they're, they're not, there's no um, <laughs> direction. I don't know, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm that's kind up. of playing your role yeah. now, now I'm asking the mm -hmm. question. That, that's, kind of, that's kind of like where I'm, when you were talking, I think mm -hmm. it's great. But I think no, you well, all were cringing as I, yeah, was I, was like, I saw out of the corner of my go. eye, like, because I can what see the yeah. <laughs> shut the front door, did she just say take a gap year? I'm just like, oh my god, I just think yeah, I can see a parent saying, wait a minute, you know, Susie wants to be, you know, a humanities major, and now you're telling her to take a gap year? Yeah, I just feel like it, it kind of perpetuates this mm -hmm. kind of like delaying, you know, life. I'm not saying it does, I could see there are many great things that come out of a gap year, I just, I don't know, I think it kind of keeps perpetuating that state and you're about to send your daughter to college, so. Yeah, and, and I, don't, I don't look at Gallup Research, I look at my bank account. I'm sorry, our bank account. Okay. Our, <laughs> my, 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 work, my wife works twice what I do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, 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 yeah, isn't it shocking? I know. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, at the end of the day, I, I think the gap year has become a luxury for families mm -hmm. who can afford for their child to do a gap year. Um, and a lot of the gap years that I'm seeing cost money, the child's not earning money. Mm -hmm. um, so, and if you can do that, all the power to you, but I don't know how it could, again, thinking about 40% of our families being first destination, mm -hmm. none of the families I'm talking with have ever heard of a gap year. Yeah. Um, it's not an option um, mm -hmm. to them. It's, it's my, my child needs to get through school, start earning, and that's one year less of earning, um, you know, or one, one year further away, so mm -hmm. that, yeah. I think that that's where, where colleges have an opportunity to play a bigger role. Uh, what we're seeing on college campuses um, is this also this other trend of four plus one year, uh, four plus one programs where in five years you get both a bachelor's and a master's degree, it costs more money, blah, blah, blah. But you still have students graduating with two degrees and not a lot of experience mm -hmm. and still back at the same, uh, um, at square one with the same challenges. Um, but I wonder if we have an opportunity for college campuses to add that one year as um, uh, an opportunity for a stronger focus on professional skills mm -hmm. uh, in partnership with industry, and um, you shouldn't have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. That it would be somehow that college campuses are, you know, some better than others, are, are, are good at uh, fundraising, that with some fundraising efforts, with some partnership with industry, that there might be an opportunity to add that fifth year and you don't get the, uh, um, the, the, the master's degree, but you get um, uh, some sort of endorsement that you are prepared mm -hmm. to take on the workforce. You know what you want and you have some, some skills and um, people like Don uh, in, uh, out in the world are really happy to have students who are, so you don't have to keep developing these boot camps yep. mm -hmm. uh, because I think it should be our job on college campuses. <laughs> yeah, and there are a lot of them. I think it should be our, and, and the reason they exist is because uh, universities aren't cutting it and, uh, on, w w when it comes to professional pr preparation. What, do you agree? Do you, what do you think? I don't know, I want to go back. I, one of the things that I think is majorly broken, okay, I'm going to go out there and y'all please don't tweet too much um, <laughs> about this, is I think the whole accreditation process mm -hmm. is majorly broken. And what I mean by that is, major universities have set up pay to play, which then became pay to recruit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the only way to get access to change curriculum was to be a friend of the dean. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's just the really bad approach. Mm -hmm. 
because it's just those companies that are helping to change the curriculum. And I think when you start to take a step back and you pull in who are your best and the brightest, who are those ones out there that did make it? Who are the ones that didn't make it? Mm -hmm. And how are those people helping for you to engage in curriculum design? I think the reason we move so slow in curriculum design is because it is this really structured process, right? Mm -hmm. We are looking at some of our schools that are paid to recruit, and we're like, okay, well, what happens if we didn't pay to recruit for a year? Because mm -hmm. I really don't need the special room anymore because I can just have them come over to my office or we can do a virtual room. Mm -hmm. Like The access I have to students is so much different. Um, and so I just put it out there as like, to me, that is one of the major things that's broken. I think you guys get a lot of flack for it because it's all tied to getting them a job. But really, if we redesigned how we look at accreditation or how we redesign curriculum, I, I just think it wouldn't be so slow, because you just mm -hmm. said mm -hmm. it's moving faster mm -hmm. than they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I feel a certain way about what you just said, you know, about, you know, these master's programs. We, every, I feel like every other, you know, month, oh, that's, that's I'm, I'm being a little dramatic there, but it seems like every other month <laughs> there's a new master's program that pops uh -huh. up, whether it's in the School of Business or School of Engineering. I mean, master's of global, you know, global affairs, what is that? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And no one clues anybody in but then you have these, and, and then the folks that they're going after are the undergraduates. So do this master's in global affairs right after you finish. And so they finish their four years, they do this master of global affairs or master's of um, arts and international administration. And really, what is that about? What are we teaching these students? And then these students graduate expecting, you know, people to be, you know, knocking on their door to, to recruit them. And they're expecting these huge salaries. And it's kind of like, womp, womp, you know, it's mm -hmm. not, that doesn't happen. <laughs> right, right. And it's really, really frustrating. So I, I really, love this idea of, and I'm going to take it back and maybe they'll do it, but I doubt it, um, of doing that fifth year where they're actually getting some work experience as opposed to another two years where they're spending a lot of money and time on this degree that may be great or maybe it's not, but now that we're expected to help them find a job that, that really doesn't exist um, or help them find a job where they're competing against undergraduates for the same salary. That's really frustrating. That's my, that's my own. I just feel so like we can do it more efficiently. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I think we can do that in four years. And we yeah. can partner with employers to be able to bridge those apprenticeships during a four year curriculum and still be able to, um, you know, regardless of cost. I don't, I think if any, you know, everything that we're looking at is that the four year degree is going to be condensed. And there's a lot, mm -hmm. uh, and we've got to figure out ways to do that. So. I like the concept, but I would like to figure out ways that we can do that more efficiently. And I know we're doing that even like instead of four plus one saying, can we actually do an undergraduate and a master's degree in four years and still be able to study abroad and still be able to have internships and still be able to have um, a, a well-rounded curriculum? And, and you, you mm -hmm. can, because I think you know for motivated students, they're willing to do that. So, um, so to me, it's just, I don't know. They're, they're, we have to look at all the different um, kind of personas of our students, and we definitely have the sprinters who are going full steam ahead. But I think, to me, the biggest thing, is, so a lot of these issues that we're discussing involve K-12, really, because it's how ready are they when they get here. But um, I feel like if we can help students to better understand themselves early and and do start to get more focused on what they're really interested in, maybe we can help to start to accelerate that process, that sort of the gift of early mm -hmm. self-awareness. Absolutely, and I think that, uh, that there's also a conversation about uh, undergraduate education maybe not needing to be four years mm -hmm. uh, at all, given that access to content and to information has changed so much in the last decade and two. Um, so uh, I, I want to wrap it up with a final question. You are the president of a university, doesn't have to be yours, or CEO of a company. Uh, you can be president of a university. Okay. She's an educator at heart, so <laughs> that's why she likes to uh, 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 do all of these programs in her company. So president or CEO of a company or a president of a university, first action that you take to um, uh, change the way we prepare talent for the future of work. First action, Susan. We, this conversation, I think, demonstrates that we need to have career services, lead, career education leaders at the table. So the first 
thing would be that, you know, you think about, if you think about the talent supply chain and the inputs of the students who are coming in and the throughputs of the curriculum process and then the outputs of our graduates who are, are, are launching every year, that there's one piece missing from the equation at every university cabinet with the exception of a few in the country. And so I would say that a president would make sure a career services leader is at a cabinet level position, um, you know, making sure that we're thinking through the full supply chain. Okay. I'll be brief. Um, a, a, a consistent, easy way for every undergraduate student to get academic credit for an internship um, so that it doesn't just depend on if you're in if you're a history major, it's easy. But if you're a media studies major, it's hard. But if you're in school of management, you, it's built in. But if you're in arts and science, it's not. Just consistency <laughs> across the board. However you want to do it, academic credit for at least one internship as a low goal. And I'm going to add to that that they don't have to pay for that yes. academic sure. credit. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. I would say um, you know you can have you can have the career services leader or career education leader at the table, but I think you need to have uh, the folks who are at the top understand what career education means. Mm -hmm. So I think it's starting with the provost and everybody else that re kind of at that level to really understand what is career education. So what that education looks like in terms of getting them to understand that either get a new provost or educate <laughs> those folks. And I'm not speaking about my university. I'm speaking about a hypothetical <laughs> university here. This is being recorded. Um, no, I, I really do think that not, they have to be at the table, but they have to understand yeah. what that means when mm -hmm. the career education person talks about it. So. That's right. Um, I'm going to put my president hat on and my <laughs> company president hat on. And I would say remove all biases from the hiring process. Mm. Oh, yeah. Why it took a company in the Valley 20 years to figure out a GPA didn't work. Still cracks me up when many companies haven't been using GPA or your school. Um, and so for me, it's around opening access to all students, students who really want to work at your company. Um, and really, or it doesn't matter if that's your lateral move or your second move, but remove bias from the interview process. I still think there's a lot of it there. And even though we all think we're trying to remove it, I still think we have opportunity. Hmm. Very good. I couldn't have ended this panel Ooh. conversation any better. So thank you very much, thank Don, you. Christian, Alex, and Susan for a wonderful conversation. And thank you all for being part of it.